the murder. The police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity, wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and a soft felt hat. sell this place when you all first left it to you? It's having this mad idea of running as a guest house? No, I don't. I love it. And talking of a guest house, just look at that. Hmm. Pretty good. What? It's a disaster. Can't you see? You've forgotten the S. Monkwell instead of Monkswell. Hmm. So I did. How did I come to do that? Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Monkwell is a good name. You're in disgrace. <laughs> no one's still got the sense of eating. Oh. 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 Roll set ICR. Shall I? Bank it up for the night now? No, you don't do that until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Oh, how appalling. Hurry up, someone may be arriving any minute now. You've got all the rooms worked out? Of course I do. Mrs. Boyle, front four post room, Major Metcalf, blue room, Mr. Wren, oak room, Miss Carswell, east room. Huh. I wonder what all these people will be like. Shouldn't we have it all read in advance? Oh no, I don't think so. We're rather mugs in this game. <coughs> they bring luggage. If they don't pay, we keep their luggage. It's quite simple. I still feel as though we should take a correspondence course in hotel keeping. We're sure to get ahead in some way. <gasps> Their luggage could be rocks wrapped in newspaper. And where will we be then? They all wrote from very good addresses. That's what servants with forged references do. They could be criminals hiding from the police. I don't care what they are, as long as they pay us seven guineas a week. Hmm. 
You're such a wonderful woman of business, Molly. Oh, Isn't it? 
Is this your new luggage? Major Metcalf, is it? Is saying to it. I'll go leave the door for him, okay? <sighs> the taxi wouldn't risk coming up to the drive. It stopped at the gate. We had to share a taxi from the station, and there's a great difficulty in getting that. <coughs> Nothing ordered to meet us, it seems. Mm. I'm so sorry. We didn't know what train you were taking. If we did, we would make sure somebody was there standing by. All trains should have been met. Let me take your coat. My wife will be down in a moment. I'll go get back out of hand with the bags. The drive could at least have been cleared of snow. Most offhand and casual, I must say. I'm so sorry, uh, Mrs. Ross? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ross. You're very young. Young. To be running an establishment of this kind. You mustn't have had much experience. Uh, well, everything has to start somewhere, hasn't it? <laughs> I see. Quite inexperienced. Dry rot. Certainly not. You know, some people don't know they've got dry rot until it's too late to do anything about it. The house is in perfect condition, Mrs. Boyle. Could do with a coat of paint. Do you know you've got worm in this oak? This way, Major! This is my wife. How do you do? Absolute blizzard outside. Thought at one time we shouldn't make it. Oh, I beg your pardon? If it goes on like this, I should say you'll have five or six feet of snow by morning. Haven't seen anything like it since I was on leave in 1940. Hmm. I'll go take the suitcases off. Hmm. Where is the rose room, did you say? Um, actually, I put Mr. Wren in the rose room because he liked the four poster so much. So it's Major Metcalf in the blue room and Mrs. Boyle in the oak room. Hmm. Major? Sir? Do you have much serving difficulty here? Oh okay, no, we have quite a good local woman who comes in from the village. And what indoor staff? No indoor staff, just us. Indeed. I understood this was a guest house in full running order. We've only just opened this place out as a guest house today. I would have said a proper staff of servants was essential for opening this kind of establishment. I consider your advertisement most misleading. May I ask if I'm the only guest here? With Major Metcalf, that is. No, there are several here. I see. This weather, too, a blizzard, no less. Well, we very unfortunate. We couldn't very well foresee the weather, Mrs. Boyle. The north wind doth blow. <laughs> and it will bring snow. And what will the robin do then, poor thing? <laughs> I love children's nursery rhymes, don't you? Always so tragic and macabre. That's why children love them. <laughs> May I introduce Mr. and Mrs. Boyle? How do you do? This is a very lovely house, don't you think? I've come to the point in my life where an, es <laughs> where an establishment's amenities are more important than the, its appearance. I would have... Mm, sorry. My anger is getting to me. I was. Mm. Mm. This place is. <sighs> if I had not believed this was a running concern, I would have never have come here. Mm. There's no obligation for you to remain here, Mrs. Boyle, if you don't want to. <sighs> no, I shouldn't think of doing so. If there's been any misapprehension, it'd be best for you to go elsewhere. I could rig up the taxi for to return. The rooms are not blocked yet. We've had so many applications for rooms that we would be able to fill your spot quite easily. In any case, we are raising our rates next month. I'm not going to leave before I've tried what this place is like. You needn't think you can turn me out now. Perhaps you'll take me up to my room? Mrs. Ralston? Uh, certainly, Mrs. Boyle. Oh, so we're right. 
It is a pleasure I before go, I'm afraid. Mm, Lord, there's another of them. <laughs> come in, come in. Break my paws, boy, a half mile down. Run into a drift. You have any more luggage in the car? Now I have a light. Hmm? Light as you've got to get by, Gary. Mr. Wren, Ms. Carswell. My wife will be down in a moment. No need to rush. Got to get myself thawed out. Looks as though we're going to be snowing up here. Happy falls expected, motorist warned. Have you got plenty of help? Oh, yes, my wife's an excellent manager. Anyway, we can always eat our hands. Before we start eating each other, right? <laughs> Any news in the paper apart from the weather? Oh, look at this rip. <laughs> Usual political crisis? Oh, yes, and a rather juicy murder. A murder? Oh, I like murder. <laughs> They seem to think it was a homicidal maniac. Stronger woman in your party to sex maniac, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't say much, does it? The police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity of Culver Street at the time. Medium heart, uh, height, wearing darkish overcoat, lighter scarf, and soft felt hat. Police messages to this effect have been broadcast throughout the day. <laughs> Useful description. Could be on anyone, wouldn't it? The police say that they're anxious to interview someone. Is that a polite way of hinting that they're the murderer? Could be. Um, who is the woman murdered? Uh, Miss Lyons, Maureen Lyons. Young or old? Yeah. Doesn't say it. Doesn't seem to have been robbery. <laughs> I told you, sex maniac. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's Miss Castle for me. My wife. How do you do? Uh, awful night, isn't it? I can show you up to your room. The water's holding the dark bar. You're right. I would. Nothing inside of it. He's probably one of those stocks around town, bilking hotel keepers. 
I don't believe it. I like him. Miss Caswell's rather odd, don't you think? Terrible female. <laughs> um, if she is a female. Charles! <laughs> I find it rather hard that all of our guests should either be unpleasant or odd. Major Metcalf seems nice. Probably drinks. <laughs> you don't think so? No, I don't. I'm just feeling rather depressed. But the worst is by now. They've all arrived. Who could that be? Probably the Culver Street murderer. Don't! <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Oh! A thousand pardons, I am a... Where am I? This is... Monkswell Manor Guest House. But what stupendous good fortune. Manor. A guest house. And a charming hostess. My Rolls Royce, alas, has run into a snowdrift. Blinding snow everywhere. I do not know where I am. Perhaps I think to myself, I shall freeze to death. But then, I take this little bag, I stagger through the snow, and I see before me big iron gates, a habitation. I am saved. <laughs> <laughs> Twice, I fall into the snow as I come up your drive. But at last I arrive, and immediately, despair turns to joy. <laughs> you can let me have a room, yes? Yes. I'm afraid it's a rather small room. Naturally, naturally. You have other guests. Uh, yes, and we've opened just, just barely opened this place as a guest house today, so we're rather new at it. Charming, charming. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about your luggage? That is of no consequence. I have locked the cash securely. But wouldn't it be better to get it? No, no. I can assure you, on such a night as this, there will be no thieves abroad. And as for myself, my wants are simple. I have all I need here in this little bag. Yes, all I need. Um, you've better get thoroughly warm, and I'll see to your room, but I'm afraid it's a rather cold room because it faces the north, but all the other we have are occupied. You have several guests, then? Uh, yes, there's a Mrs. Boyle, Major Metcalf, Miss Caswell, a young man named Christopher Wren, and now you. Yes, the unexpected guest, the <laughs> guest that you did not invite, the guest who arrived out of nowhere from the storm. It sounds quite dramatic, does it not? <laughs> who am I? You do not know. Where do I come from? You do not know. <laughs> Me? I am the man of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you this, I complete the picture. From now on, there will be no more arrivals and no departure either. By tomorrow, perhaps even already, we are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman, no postman, no daily papers, nobody and nothing but ourselves. That is admirable, admirable. It could not suit me better. My name, by the way, is Farabit Shimmy. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ralston? And this is Monswell Manor Guest House, you said. Good. Monswell Manor Guest House. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I 
shall speak about it. Very comfortable beds, too. At least mine was. I hope yours was, too. Here's quite out of it. I don't see really why the best bedroom should have been given to that very peculiar young man. Got here ahead of us. First come, first served. From the advertisement, I got a quite a impression of what this place would be like. A comfortable writing room and a much larger place altogether, with bridge and other amenities. Regular old Tabby's delight. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Yes, I quite see what you mean. <laughs> no, I shan't stay here long. <laughs> no, no, I don't suppose you will. <laughs> mm, what a peculiar young man, unbalanced mentally, I shouldn't wonder. It's escaped from a lunatic asylum. <laughs> I shouldn't think so. Giles! Yes? Could you shovel the snow away again from the back door? Going! I'll give you a hand. What? Good exercise. Must have exercise. Done? I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. <laughs> Forget things. 
It doesn't make me forget. How fierce you sound. I was thinking. What sort of thinking? Ice on a bedroom job. Chill blames. Raw and thin rock blocking. Child shivering with cold and fear. My dear, it sounds too grim. What is it? A novel? You didn't know it was a writer, did you? Are you? Sorry to disappoint you. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> to get the wireless license, didn't I? Yes, it's in the kitchen dresser. Hmm. I had a rather near shave, near shave with a car the other day. But it was entirely that other fellow's fault. He must have done something. Probably something to do with running this place. He probably thought some temporal regulation or some ministry or other. <laughs> Practically can't avoid it nowadays. Oh, Giles, I do wish we never started this stupid place. We're going to be snowed up for days and everyone's cross and we'll go through all of us over ten. Molly, everything's all right at the moment. It's all good. I've done the hens, I've chopped wood, and I've cleaned up everything I can. Now I'll go do the boiler and make sure the kindling's all good too, all right? Mm. Mm. Still though, it's strange to send a Sergeant Trigg and do all of this. Must be something really urgent. There you are, Mr. Ralston. Do you know the central heating in the library is practically stone cold? I'm very sorry, Mrs. Boyle. I pay seven guineas a week here. Seven guineas, and I do not want to freeze. I'll go and stoke it up. Mrs. Ralston, if you don't mind me saying so, that's a very extraordinary young man you are staying here. His Manners in his times, and does he even brush his hair? He's an extremely brilliant young architect. I beg your pardon, Christopher Wren is an architect. <laughs> My dear young woman, I have naturally heard of Sir Christopher Wren. Of course he's an architect. He built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think no one is educated but yourselves. No, I mean this Wren. His name is Christopher. His parents named him that of hopes of him becoming an architect. And he is. Oh, almost is, rather. So, it seemed to work out all right. <laughs> Sounds a fishy story to me. I have made some inquiries about him. What do you know of this boy? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle, which is that you are both paying us seven guineas a week to stay here. <laughs> and that's all I really need to know. All that's important to me it doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests or whether I don't. <laughs> you are young and inexperienced and should welcome advice from someone more knowledgeable than yourself. And what about this foreigner? What about him? You weren't expecting him, were you? To turn away a bona fide traveller is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You of all people should know that. Well, all I'm saying is that this paravincini, or whatever he calls himself, seems to be the lady. <laughs> Talk of the devil, and there he is. I did to you. You come in. I came in on tiptoe, like this. 
<laughs> Nobody ever hears me if I do not want them to. I find that very amusing. Indeed. Now, there was a young lady. I must get on with my letters. I'll see if it's a little warmer in the drawing room.
exhausted. This telephone is dead. Quite dead. It was all right about 30 minutes ago. Along with the weight of the snow, I suppose. <laughs> so we're cut off now. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I don't see anything to laugh at. No, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's, it's nothing. It's just a private joke of my own. Yes, the sleuth has returned. <laughs> All right. Now we can get back to business. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. Uh, would you like to talk to us alone? We can go to the library. Oh, no, sir, that won't be necessary. It will save time if everyone is present. If I may sit. I beg your pardon? Thank you. <laughs> Do tell us what we've done, Sergeant. Done? Oh, it's nothing of that kind, Mrs. Rolston. It's actually something quite different. It's more a matter of police protection, if you understand me. Police protection? Yes, miss. It relates to the death of Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Maureen Lyon of 24 Culver Street, West 2, who was found murdered yesterday, the 15th instant. You may have heard or read about the case? Yes, I, I heard it on the wireless, the woman who was strangled. Yes, ma'am. First thing I want to know is if either of you were acquainted with this Mrs. Lyon. Never heard of her. You may have known her under the name of Lyon, you know. You see, Lyon wasn't her real name. She had a police record and a fingerprints on file, so we could identify her very quickly. Her real name was Maureen Standing, and her husband was John Standing of the Longridge Farm. Um, Longridge Farm? Wasn't that where there was children? Yes, sir, the Longridge Farm case. Three children. Yes, ma'am. The Corrigans, two boys and a girl, broke before the court in need of care and protection. A home was found with them, with the Stannings, and one of the children subsequently died as a result of criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. It was horrible. Yes. That's why, on receiving this information, Superintendent Hopan thought it important for me to get down here and see if you or anyone else in the household had any connection between them and the Longwood Chronicles. No. None. No connection. Absolutely none. It must be a coincidence. Superintendent Hogbent does not think it's a coincidence, sir. He'd have come here himself if it had been in any way possible. Unfortunately, due to conditions, and as I can ski, he sent me with instructions to try and keep the safety of the household. Safety? What kind of, del kind of danger does he think we're in? Surely he's not suggesting somebody's going to be killed here. I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, but frankly, sir, that's the idea. But why? That's what I'm here to find out. But the whole thing's crazy. Yes, sir, it's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Nonsense! I must say, it's a bit far-fetched. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something that you aren't telling us, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. You see, the Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. John Stanning died in prison, and Mrs. Stanning was released, but, as I say, she was found murdered yesterday. And we also picked up a notebook near the scene of the crime, and in that notebook had two addresses, 24 Culver Street and Monsoir Manor. Unfortunately, below that was written three blind mice, and on the dead woman's body was a paper with this is the first written on it. Below that was a drawing of three blind mice and the tune to the three blind mice song. We all know how it goes. Three blind mice. Three blind mice. See how they run? They all ran after the farmer's wife. Oh, that's horrible. Um, there were three children and one died. Yes, sir. The youngest, a boy of eleven. <laughs> what, what happened to the other two? The girl was adopted by someone. I haven't been able to trace her. The eldest would now be around 22, desertion from the army. And according to the army psychologist, definitely schizophrenic. A bit queer in the head, that's to say. So they think it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Stanning? And that he's going to show up here and try to kill us all, all one of us. But why? 
but I'm glad to find out from you. Now, you state, sir, that you never had any connection with the business at Longridge Farm. <coughs> no. The same goes for you, ma'am. Uh, I mean no connection. Right, and what about servants? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't any servants, and that reminds me. Uh, I'll be in the kitchen if you need me, but there's much work to be done. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Now, can I get each of your names, please? This is quite ridiculous. We are merely staying in a kind of hotel. We've nothing to do with this place. We've just arrived here yesterday. You plan to come here ahead of time. You booked your room here. Well, yes, all except for... Pargicini. My car of our I see. What I'm getting at here is that anyone who's been following you around might know very well that you are coming here. Now there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quickly. Which one of you is it that has some connection with that Longridge Farm case? You're not being very <laughs> sensible, you know. One of you is in danger, deadly danger, and I have to know which one that is. <laughs> All right, I'll ask you one by one. Start with you, since you seem to arrive here more or less by accident, Mr. Pari. Parra. Paravicini. But, my dear inspector, I know nothing, but nothing of what you have been talking about. I am a stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. Mrs. Boyle. I don't see, really. I consider it an impertinence. Why should I have anything to do with this? Distressing business. Miss Carswell. Leslie Carswell. I never heard of the Longridge Farm case, and I know nothing about it. And you, sir? Metcalf, Major. Read about it in the papers. Was stationed at Edinburgh then. No personal knowledge. And what about you? Christopher Run. I was a mere child at the time. I don't remember even hearing about it. That's all any of you have to say. Any of you. All right. If one of you gets murdered, you'll have yourselves to blame. <laughs> now then, Mr. Ralston, if I can get a tour of the house. I've always admired the police, so stern and hard-boiled. What a thrill this whole business. <laughs> Three blind mice. How does the tune go? Really, Mr. Wren? But don't you like it? It's the signature tune. It's the signature of the murderer. Fancy what a kick you must be getting out of this. <laughs> Melodramatic rubbish. I don't believe a word of it. But just you wait, Mrs. Boyle, till I come up behind you and you feel my hands on your throat. Stop! That'll do, Christopher. It's a poor joke anyway. In fact, it's not a joke at all. Oh, that's what it is, though. A madman's joke. That's what makes it so deliciously macabre. <laughs> oh, if you could just see your faces. A singularly ill mannered and neurotic young man! Where's Giles? Taking our policeman on a conducted tour of the house. Mrs. Ralston, your friend, the architect, has been behaving in most abnormal manner. Young fellows seem nervy nowadays. They're saying he'll grow out of it. <laughs> Nerves? I have no patience with people who say they have nerves. I haven't any nerves. No, perhaps that's just as well for you, Mrs. Boyle. <laughs> Why do you say that? I think you were one of the magistrates on the bench at that time. In fact, you were the one responsible for sending those three children to Longridge Farm. <laughs> really, Major Metcalf? I can hardly be held responsible. We had reports from the welfare works. The farm people seemed most nice and most anxious to have the children. It seemed most satisfactory. There was fresh eggs and fresh milk and healthy out-of-the-doors life. Kicks, blows, 
starvation, and a thoroughly vicious couple. But how was I supposed to know? They were very civilly spoken. Yes. I was right. It was you. One tries to do a public duty, and all one gets is abuse. <laughs> <laughs> you must forgive me, but indeed, I find all this most amusing. I enjoy myself greatly. <laughs> You never did like that man. Where did he come from last night? I don't know. He looks like a bit of a spit to me. Makes his face up too. Nervous and powder. Disgusting. He must be quite old too. And yet he skips about as though he were quite young. You'll be wanting more wood. I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only four in the afternoon and it's already getting dark. I'll turn the lights on. psychologists and psychiatrists. I've never really had much to do with them. Good thing for you, you have it. The whole thing's a lot of hooey. Life's what you make of it. Go straight ahead and don't look back. One can't help looking back. Nonsense. It's a question of willpower. I suppose. I know. But sometimes things happen to, to make you remember. Don't give in. Turn your back on them. Is that really the right way, I suppose? Perhaps that's all wrong. Perhaps one really ought to face them. Depends on what you're talking about. Sometimes I hardly even know what I'm talking about. Nothing from the past is going to affect me, except the way I want it to. Well, everything looks fine up Here already. 
Why not, Mr. Ralston? These people arrived here just yesterday evening, some hours after the murder. Plenty of time to get here. Well, except for Barbacini, they all booked beforehand. Well, why not? These crimes were planned. Crimes? What crimes? There was one crime in Culver Street. Why so sure another will happen here? That another could happen. No, I hope to prevent that. That it will be attempted, yes. I can't believe it. It's so fantastic. It's not fantastic, sir. It's just facts. You, you have a description of what this, this man looked like in London? <clears throat> Medium height, indeterminate build, darkish overcoat, felt hat, voice spoke in a whisper, face hidden by a muffler. There are three dark overcoats on your coat rack right now, and one of them is yours, Mr. Ralston. There are some hats as well. I just can't believe it. You see, it's this telephone wire that concerns me. If it's been cut... I must go to the kitchen get on with the vegetables. Is there an extension? Did you say something? Yes, sir. I asked you if there was an extension. Yes, um, in our bedroom. Go and try it up there for me, will you? Understand what I term as the mechanics of fear. You have to study the precise effect produced on the human mind. Imagine, for instance, that you are alone in the womb. It is late in the afternoon. A door opens softly behind you. You did not expect. Oh, it's you. I can't find a program worth listening to. Why don't you turn out the lights? What's going on? <laughs> Can you see she's all in? 
We're investigating a murder, Mr. Ralston, and up until now, nobody has taken this thing seriously. Mrs. Boyle didn't. She held out on me with information. You all held out on me. Mrs. Boyle is dead. And unless we get to the bottom of this and quickly mind, there may be another death. <coughs> another? Nonsense. Why? Because there were three blind mice. A death for each of them. There would have to be a connection. Another connection with the Longridge Farm case. Yes, that would have to be that. Why another death here? Because there were only two addresses in the notebook we picked up. Now at 24 Calder Street, there was only one possible victim, and she's dead. But here <coughs> comes Will Manor, there's a wide field. Nonsense. Surely it would be an unlikely coincidence that there should be two people brought here by chance. Both of them with a share of the Long Ridge Farm case? Given the certain circumstances, it wouldn't be so much of a coincidence. Think it out, Miss Caswell. Now I want to get down quite clearly where everyone was when Mrs. Boyle was killed. I've already got Mrs. Ralston's statement. You were in the kitchen preparing vegetables. You came out of the kitchen, along the hall, through the passage, through that swing door and in here. Radio was blaring, but the light was switched off. You turned on the light, saw Mrs. Boyle, and screamed. Yes. I screamed and I screamed and at last people came. Yes, as you say, people came. Lots of people from different directions, all arriving more or less at the same time. Now when I went out that window to trace the telephone wire, you, Mr. Ralston, went upstairs to the room you and Mrs. Ralston occupied to check the extension. Where were you when Mrs. Ralston screamed? I was still up in the bedroom. The extension telephone was dead too, like so. I went to the window and opened it to see if I could see if the line was cut, but I couldn't see anything. As soon as I closed the window, I heard Molly scream and I rushed down. Those simple actions took you a rather long time, didn't they, Mr. Ralston? I shouldn't think so. I should say you definitely took your time over them. I was thinking about something. <laughs> Very well. Now, Mr. Wren, I'll have your account of where you were. I was in the kitchen, seeing if there was anything I could do to help Mrs. Ralston. I adore cooking. And after that, I went upstairs to my bedroom. Why? It's quite a natural thing to go to one's bedroom. I mean, one wants to be alone sometimes. You went to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. Uh, and I wanted to tidy up for you. Brush your hair. <laughs> you wanted to brush your hair. Anyways, that's where I was. And you heard Mrs. Ralston scream? Yes. And you came downstairs? Yes. Curious that you and Mr. Ralston didn't meet on the stairs. I went down by the back stairs, they're closer to my room. Did you go up by the back stairs as well? Yes. I see. And you, Mr. Parvancini. I have told you, I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Through there, through there, Inspector. I'm not an inspector, just a sergeant. Could anyone hear you playing the piano? I do not expect so. I was playing very, very softly. One finger soft. <laughs> <laughs> you were playing free by mice. Is that so? Yes, it is quite a catchy little tune. It is a, how shall I say, a haunting tune. Don't you all agree? I think it's horrible. <laughs> and yet, it runs in people's heads. Someone was whistling it too. Whistling it? Where? I am not sure. Perhaps on the front hall, perhaps on the stairs, perhaps even upstairs in the bedroom. <laughs> Who was whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Parvancini? No, no, Inspector. I beg your pardon. Sergeant, I would not do such a thing like that. Go on, you were playing the piano. One finger soft. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hear the radio playing very loud. Someone is shouting on it. It offended my ears. <laughs> and then, after that, suddenly, I hear Mrs. Ralston scream. Mr. Ralston upstairs, Mr. Wren upstairs, Mr. Parvancini in the drawing room. 
Miss Caswell, I was writing letters in the library. Could you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Mrs. Rawson screamed. And what did you do then? I came in here. At once? I think so. You say you were writing letters when you heard Mrs. Ralston scream? Yes. And you caught up hurriedly from the writing table and came in here? Yes. And yet there doesn't seem to be any unfinished letter on the writing table in the library. I brought it with me. <clears throat> Dearest Jessie, Oh, friend or relation, that's not your damn business. <laughs> Indeed. You know, if I were to hear someone scream blue murder, I don't think I would take the time to pick up my unfinished letter, fold it, and put it in my handbag before going to see what was the matter. You wouldn't. How interesting. <laughs> uh, now then, Major Metcalf, I have your explanation. You say you were in the cellar. Why? Looking around, just looking around, I looked into that cupboard place under the stairs near the kitchen. Lots of junk and sports tackle. I no and I noticed another door inside of it. I opened it and I saw it by the steps. I, cu I was curious and I went down. Nice cellars you've got. Uh, do you like them? <laughs> Not at all. Crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why this place is called the Monk's Well. We're not interested in antiquarian research, Major Metcalf. We are investigating a murder. Mrs. Ralston said she heard a door shut with a faint creak, and that particular door does shut with a creak. It could be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Ralston coming from the kitchen. It could be that he slipped into that cupboard and shut it behind him. A lot of things could be. <laughs> <laughs> the would be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Mine are there, all right, but most criminals are careful to wear gloves, aren't they? It's usual, but most criminals slip up now and then. I wonder, if Sergeant, if that's really true. Look, Sergeant, are we wasting time? There's only one person- Mr. Ralston, please. I am in charge of this investigation. Oh, very well, but- Mr. Ralston! Thank you. Now, we've got to establish opportunity as well as motive. And let me say now, every single one of you had a motive. There are two staircases! <coughs> there are two staircases. Anyone can go up by one and come down by another. Anyone can go down to the cellar and come up through a trap door over there. The vital fact is that every single one of you was alone at the time of Mrs. Boyle's death. Look here, Sergeant. You speak as though we are all under suspicion. That's absurd. In a murder investigation, Mr. Ralston, everyone is under suspicion. But you know pretty well who killed that woman on Culver Street. You think it is the eldest of those three children, a mentally abnormal young man who is now 23 years of age. Well, damn it all, there's only one person here who fits the bill. It's not true. It's not true. You're all against me. You're going to frame me for murder. It's persecution is what it is. Persecution! Steady, lad. Steady. <laughs> it's all right, Chris. Nobody's against you. Tell him everything's all right. We don't frame people. Tell him you're not going to arrest him. In order to make an arrest, I have to have evidence. And I haven't got any evidence yet. I think you're crazy, Molly. And you too. There's only one person here who fits the bill. And if only as a safety measure, he ought to be put under arrest. Wait, Giles. It is only fair to the rest of us. Giles. Sergeant Troy, can I speak to you for a minute? Certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Will the rest of you please go into the dining room? <coughs> I'm staying. No, Giles, you too, please. I'm staying, Molly. I don't know what's come over you. Please. 
Yes, Mrs. Ralston, what is it you want to speak to me about? Sergeant Trotter, you think that is the eldest of those three children at the farm, that some homicidal maniac and he's going to show up here and try and kill us, but you don't know that, do you? In all honesty, Mrs. Ralston, we don't really know anything. All we've got is that the lady who joined her husband in ill-treating and starving those children has been killed. The lady magistrate who was responsible for sending those children to the Longridge farm has also been killed. The telephone wire that connects me with police headquarters has been cut. You don't know that. It could just be down with the snow. No, Mrs. Rolston. I found the place. It was deliberately cut. I see. So either way, you don't know. Please, Mrs. Rolston, all probabilities leave one way. Childish mentality, mental instability, desertion from the army and the army psychologist report. Yes, I know, and therefore it all seems to point to Christopher. But, but I don't believe he, it is Christopher. Th there must be other possibilities. Such as? Hadn't those children any relations at all? Their mother was a drunk. She died soon after the children were taken from her. What about their father? <coughs> Army sergeant serving abroad. If he's alive, he's probably discharged by now. You don't know where he is now. We've no information. But you must remember, Mrs. Ralston, the police are taking everything into account. But if the son is mentally unstable, the father may be mentally unstable too. It's possible. <coughs> Say he came home after going through something terrible, being a prisoner with the Japs, perhaps. If he came home and found his wife dead, <coughs> and that his children had gone through something terrible, and one of them had died through it, he might go off his head a bit and want revenge. That's only some rise. But it's possible. Yes, Mrs. Ralston, it's quite possible. So, the murder may be middle-aged or even old? Major Metcalf seemed frightfully upset when I said the police had rung up. He really did, I saw his face. Major Metcalf? <clears throat> Middle-aged, soldier. He seems quite nice and perfectly normal, but it might be show, my dear. No, often it doesn't show at all. So, Christopher's not the only suspect. There's Major Metcalf as well. Any other suggestions? Mr. Parvancini did drop the poker when I said the police had rung her up. Mr. Parvancini? Yes, I know he seems quite old and foreign and everything, but he <laughs> might really be as old as he looks. He moves like a much younger man. He wears makeup on his face. Miss Caswell noticed it too. This sounds quite melodramatic, but he might be disguised. You're very anxious that it shouldn't be young Mr. Wren. He just, he seems so helpless and so unhappy. Let me tell you now, Mrs. Ralston, the police have had all possibilities in mind since the beginning. The little boy Georgie, the father. And you must remember that there was a lady. The sister. He could have been a woman who killed Marine Lyon. Voice spoke in a whisper, muffler pulled over their face, hat on their head. You know, it's the voice that gives the sex away. Yes, it could have been a woman. Miss Caswell? She looks a bit old for the part, doesn't she? And you must remember, there's also yourself. Me? You're at an age. Should I But there's to... nothing you can say now that I can prove for real evidence, you must remember. There's also your husband. Giles, don't be ridiculous. He and Christopher Wren aren't much of an age. Say your husband looks older than he really is, and Christopher Wren looks younger. Actual age is very hard to tell. How much do you know about your husband? How much do I know about Giles? Don't be ridiculous. You've been married how long? Just a year. And you met him where? At a dance in London. <clears throat> we went in a party. Meet his people, did you? He hasn't any people. They're all dead. They're all dead? Yes, but you make it sound much worse than it actually is. His father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. You're only telling me what he told you. Yes, but... You don't know any of this to your own knowledge. It's outrageous that... Mrs. Ralston, you would be surprised at how many cases like yours we get. Especially since the war. Homes broken, families dead. Man says he's just finished his army training or gotten out of the Air Force. Parents are killed. 
child and no relation. There are no backgrounds nowadays, and young people want to take affairs into their own hands. They meet and marry. It used to be that parents or relatives would make inquiries before consenting to an engagement, but that's all done away with now. The girl just marries a man. And she doesn't find out for a year or two that he's an absconding bank clerk or an army deserter or something equally undesirable. How long had you known Giles Ralston before you married him? Just three weeks, but... So you don't know anything about him? That's not true. I know everything about him. I know exactly the sort of person he is. He, he's Giles, and it's, it's absolutely absurd for you to suggest that he's some crazy homicidal maniac. Why, Giles wasn't even in London yesterday when the murder took place. <laughs> Where was he? Here. No, he went across the countryside to get some wire netting for our chickens. Bring it back with him? No, it wasn't the right kind. Only 30 miles from London, aren't you? Oh, look, you've got a train schedule. Let's see, only an hour to London by train, a little longer by car. I tell you, Giles was not in London! Just a minute, Mrs. Ralston. Is this your husband's coat? Yes. The London Times sold yesterday on the streets at around 3.30 in the afternoon. I don't believe it. Don't you? Don't you? Actually studying to be an architect? No. <laughs> <laughs> then, then why did you call myself Christopher Rep? It amused me. <laughs> the kids at school they used to laugh at me and call me little Christopher Robin. Robin ran Association of Ideas. It was hell being at school. What's your real name? We needn't go into that. I ran away whilst I was doing my army service. It was all so Yes, and just like the unknown murderer. I told you I was the one the specifications fit. You, you see, my mother, my mother. Yes, your mother? Everything would have been all right if she hadn't died. She would have looked after me. She would have taken care of me. You can't go on being looked after all your life, Chris. Things, things happen to you and you've just got to get past them and go on just as usual. One can't do that. Yes, one can. You mean you have? Yes! What was it? Something very bad? Something I've never forgotten. <coughs> was it to do with Giles? No, it was long before I met Giles. He must have been young, almost a child. Perhaps that's why it was so awful. Horrible. Well, I, I try to put it out of my mind. I try not to think on it. So you're running away from things too? Running away instead of facing them? <laughs> yes, perhaps in a way I am. You know, from not meeting until yesterday, we seem to have a lot in common. Yes. Odd, isn't it? I don't know. I suppose there's a sort of sympathy between us. Anyways, you think I ought to stick it out? Well, frankly, what else can you do? I could pinch the sergeant's skis. I can ski quite well. That would be frightfully <laughs> stupid. <laughs> it would be almost like admitting you're guilty. Sergeant Trotter thinks I'm guilty. No, I'm sure he doesn't... I don't know what he thinks. I hate him. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him! Oh. Sergeant Trotter, he, he puts things in your head, things that aren't true, that can't possibly be true! What is all this? Come on, out with it. 
You see this? Yes. What is it? A paper. A London paper. And it was in Giles' pocket, but Giles wasn't in London yesterday. Oh, that's all right. He was home all day. But he wasn't. He went across the countryside to get wire netting. Well, perhaps he went to London after all. Then why shouldn't he tell me that? Why lie? Well, maybe it was news of this murder. He just... But Giles didn't know about the murder. Oh, oh, did he? Did he? Good Lord, Molly, surely you don't think the sergeant doesn't think. I don't know what the sergeant thinks, and he puts things in your head that aren't true, and he makes you think that someone that you know quite well and you love is someone that you don't know at all, and that's what happens in a nightmare. You're in a room full of people, and suddenly you can look at their faces, and they're not people you know anymore. They're strangers, and maybe you can't really trust anybody. Maybe everybody's a stranger. I seem to be interrupting something. <laughs> no, we were just talking. I I must get to the kitchen and do the best. I'll oh, come give you a hand. No, you won't. Giles. Tell it, Ted, it's all very healthy at present, Ren. You stay out of the kitchen and stay away from my wife. Uh, really? Look. You look. stay away from my wife, Ren. She's not going to be the next victim. So that's what you think of me. I've already said so, haven't I? There's a kid on the loose, and it seems to me you fit the bill. I'm not the only one to fit the bill. I don't see who else does. How blind are you? Or do you just pretend I'm to be I'm just blind? looking after my wife's safety. So am I. I'm not going to leave you alone with her. Help! Please go, Christopher. I'm not going. Please go, I'm being serious. I shan't be far away. Molly, have you gone daft? Crazy. <clears throat> Perfectly prepared to show yourself in the kitchen with that homicidal maniac. He isn't. You've only got to look at him to say he's balmy. He isn't, Giles. I tell you, he's just unhappy. I know if he was dangerous. And anyways, I can look after myself. That's what Mrs. Boyle said. Don't stop it. What is there between you and that wretched boy? What do you mean by between us? I feel sorry for him, that's all. Perhaps you met him before. Perhaps you told him to stay here and pretend for them to meet for the first time. All cooked up between you, was it? Have you gone completely mad? How dare you suggest these things? Rather odd, is it, that he should come and stay in an out of the way place like this? No order that that Mrs. Boyle or Major Metcalf or Miss Caswell should! Hmm. I read once in the paper that these homicidal cases could attract women. Looks as though it were true. How long have you been meeting him? Where did you meet him? How long has this been going on? You're being absolutely ridiculous. I never set eyes on Christopher Wren until he arrived here yesterday. That's what you said. Perhaps you've been going on and meeting him on the sly. Where do you think I'm supposed to meet him? Hmm. Yeah, in London. You know very well that I haven't been up to London for weeks. You haven't been up to London for weeks? What do you Is mean? Is that so? It's quite true. Really? Then what's this? A glove. Yes, <laughs> a glove. You dropped it yesterday. I picked it up this morning when I was talking to Detective Sergeant Trotter. You see what's inside it? A London bus ticket. Oh, that. <laughs> so you. It looks as though you didn't only go to the village yesterday. You went to London as well. All oh, right, I went. To Whilst I was safely racing round the countryside. <laughs> Whilst you were safely racing round the countryside. Come on now, admit it. You went to London. All right, fine. I went to London. So did you! What? So did you! You brought back an evening paper! Where did you get a hold of that? It was in your overcoat pocket. Anyone could have put that there. Did they? No, you were in London. All right. <laughs> I went to London. <laughs> but I did go to meet a woman there. <laughs> What? 
Do you mean? Go away, don't come near me. What's the matter? Don't touch me! <laughs> did you go and meet Christopher Wren in London? Don't be ridiculous, of course I didn't. Then why did you go? Perhaps I shall tell you why I went to London. <laughs> Maybe now I've forgotten why. Molly, you're acting different all of a sudden. <coughs> it's as though I don't know you anymore. Maybe you never really did know me. We've been married how long a year? But you don't really know anything about me. What I've been through or felt or suffered before you met me? Molly, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, I'm crazy. Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. What the hell? <laughs> I do hope you both are saying a little more than you mean. What is so apt in these lovers' quarrels? Lovers' quarrels. That's good. Quite so, quite so. I know just how you feel. I have been through all this myself when I was a younger man. Je ne sais, je ne sais, as the poet says. Not been married long, I imagine. That's no business of yours, Parvacini. No, no, no business at all. But I just came in to say that the sergeant cannot find his and I'm afraid he's very annoyed. Christopher. What was that? He wants to know if you by any chance moved them, Mr. Ralston. No, of course not. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston, have either of you removed a pair of skis from the cupboard where we put them? No. Well, somebody's taken them. What made you happen to look for them? I need help here, reinforcements. I was going to ski down to Market Hampton to report on the situation. And <laughs> now you can't. Dear, dear. <laughs> Somebody seen to it that you certainly shan't do that. But there could be another reason, couldn't there? Yes, what? Somebody may want to get away. What did you mean when you said Christopher just now? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so our young architect has hooked it, Matthew. <coughs> Very, very interesting. Mrs. Ralston, is this true? I, I'm not. Oh, thank goodness you haven't gone. Mr. Wren, have you taken my skis? Your skis, I did all well enough. Mrs. Ralston seemed to think. Mr. Wren is very fond of skiing. I thought he might have <laughs> taken them to go <laughs> exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise. Now listen, you people, this is a serious matter. Someone has taken my only means of communication to the world. I want everyone here at once. I think Miss Caswell has gone upstairs. I'll get her. I left Major with my cat in the dining room. Major Rebecca! Now. <laughs> I'll go and look for him. Hello? <laughs> Wanting me? It's a question of my skis, sir. Skis? Mr. Olsen! Yes. You remove a pair of skis from the kitchen cupboard? Good lord, eh? Hey. Why should I? Because I haven't touched them. Nevertheless, they are gone. Which way did you go up to your room? By the back stairs. So you passed by that cupboard when you went up? If you say so, I have no idea where your skis are. You were actually in that cupboard today. Yes, I was. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed, I had gone down to the cellar. So, the skis were in there then when you passed through? I haven't the least idea. It's quite easy to see the skis, so they must have been in there. Can't remember. You must remember if you saw my skis, sir! No good shouting at me, young fellow. I wasn't thinking about any damn skis. I was interested in the cellars. Architecture of this place is very interesting. I opened the other door, and I saw a flood of steps, and I went down. So I can't tell you whether the skis were there or not. You do realize that you yourself had an excellent opportunity of taking them? Yes, yes, I grant you that. If I wanted to, that is. 
question is, where are they now? Ought to be able to find them if we all set to. Not a case of hunt the thimble, whacking great things, skis. Supposing we all set to. Not them. quite so fast, Major Metcalf. That may be, you know, what we are meant to do. Huh? I don't get you. <laughs> I'm in a position now where I've got to put myself in the place of a crazy, cunning brain. I've got to ask myself what he wants us to do next and what he himself is planning to do. I've got to think about what he wants. And if I don't, there may be another death. You really still, still believe all of that, do you? Yes, Miss Caswell, I do. Three blind mice. Two mice cancel out, one to go. Nobody that's killed twice is going to hesitate to kill a third time. One of you in here is a killer. One of you is a killer. Who that is, I do not know, but I shall. One of you is the killer's prospective victim. That is the person I am speaking to now. Mrs. Boyle held out on me with information. Mrs. Boyle is dead. You, whoever you are, are holding out on me. Well, don't, because you're in danger. And as it is, I don't know which one of you it is that needs protection. Come on now! Anyone who knows anything, who have a slide that has to do with that bygone business, had better come out with it! <laughs> All right. You won't. I'll get the killer. I've no doubt of that. But it may be too late for one of you. And as it is, the murderers have joined themselves. Yeah, then enjoy himself a good deal. Um. <laughs> Dr. Chicken here. Have you ever tried chicken's liver that is served on toast that has been thickly smeared with foie gras with a very thin rasher of bacon just touched with a soupçon of fresh mustard? I will come with you to the kitchen and see. I'll you be know. helping my wife, Barbara Chini. <laughs> Your husband is afraid for you. Quite natural under the circumstances. He doesn't fancy your being alone with me. It is my sadistic tendencies he fears, not my dishonorable ones. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, what an inconvenience the husband always is. <laughs> I'm sure Giles he doesn't. He's very wise, takes no chances. Can I prove to you or to him or to our dogged sergeant that I'm not a homicidal maniac? So difficult to prove a negative. And I suppose that I am, really. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't. <laughs> but such a gay little tune. She just cut off their tails with a carving knife. Sneak, sneak, sneak. <laughs> Delicious. Just what a child would adore. Cruel little things, children. Some of them never grow up. Stop frightening my wife at once, Mama Chini. I, I know it's silly, but I was the one who found her. And I just, I can't get it out of my head. I can't forget it. Yes, it's difficult to forget things, isn't it? You really aren't the forgetting kind. Uh, I must go to the kitchen and do the vegetables. Giles! what you said to the ladies who upset her? Oh, no, me, Sergeant. Just a little innocent fun. I've always been fond of a little joke. You know, there's nice fun, and then there's fun that's not so nice. Now I do wonder what you mean by that, Sergeant. Oh, I've been doing a little wondering about you, sir. Indeed? Yes, I've been thinking about that car of yours and how it just so happened to overturn in a snowdrift so conveniently. In conveniently, you mean, don't you, Sergeant? That rather depends on the way you're looking at it. Just where were you bound for when you had this accident? I was on my way to see a friend. In this neighborhood? Not so very far from here. And what was the name and address of this friend? Now really, Sergeant Trotter, does that matter now? I mean, it has nothing to do with our current predicament, has it? We police like to have the fullest of information. What did you say your friend's name was? 
I didn't say. <laughs> no, you didn't. And it seems you're not going to say. Now that's rather interesting. But there might be so many reasons. And at my discretion, these jealous husbands. <laughs> they all to be running around with the ladies, aren't you, sir? <laughs> my dear sergeant, I am not perhaps quite so old as I look. That's just what I've been thinking, sir. What? That you're not as old as you try to look. Most people nowadays want to look younger. But when someone wants to look older, one does have to ask oneself why. Having asked so many questions of so many people, you ask questions of yourself as well. Isn't that overdoing things? I may get answers for myself, but I'm clearly not getting any from you. Well, well. Try again. That is, if you have any more questions to ask. Oh, uh, only one or two. Where did you come from last night? That is simple, from London. Where in London? I always stay at the Ritz Hotel. Oh, very nice, I'm sure. <coughs> Tell me address. I dislike permanency. Business or profession? <laughs> I play the markets. Stockbroker? No, no, you misunderstand me. <laughs> Enjoying the sale game, aren't you? Sure of yourself, too. But I shouldn't be too sure. You must remember, sir, that you were involved in a murder case. And murder is not fun in games. Not even this murder. <laughs> Dear me, Sergeant Trotter, you are very serious. I always thought the policeman couldn't take a joke. Well, is the Inquisition over? For the moment. For the moment, yes. Thank you so much. I shall go look for your skis in the drawing room, just in case someone has hidden them in the grand piano. <laughs> just a minute, please. Were you speaking to me? Yes, if you would come and sit. Well? What do you want now? You might have heard some of the questions I was asking, Mr. Parvachini. Oh, I heard that. I'd like to have a little information from you now. What do you want to know? Your full name and address, please. <coughs> Leslie, Margaret, Catherine, Kaiser. Catherine? I spell it with a K. Uh, quite so. Address? Via Mariposa, Pino Dio Mallorca. That's in Italy? It's an island, a Spanish island. And what's your address in England? Care of Morgan's Bank, Leadenhall Street? No other English address? No. And how long have you been here? A week. What brought you to Moxwell Manor? I wanted someone quiet in the country. Hmm. And how long do you or want to propose to stay here until I finished what I came here to do. And what was that? And what was that? Huh? What was it you came here to do? I beg your pardon, I was thinking of something else. You still haven't answered my question. I really don't see, you know, why I should. It's a matter that concerns me alone. A strictly private affair. All the same, Miss Caswell. <laughs> no, I don't think we'll argue about this. If you wouldn't mind telling me your age. Not in the least. It's on my passport. I'm 24. 24? Mm. You were thinking I look quite older. That is quite true. Is there anyone in this country who can vouch for you? My bank will reassure you as to my financial position. I can also refer you to a solicitor, a very discreet man. I am not in a position to offer you a social reference. I've lived most of my life abroad. In Mallorca. In Mallorca and other places. Were you born abroad? No, I left England when I was 13. No, Miss Caswell, I can't quite make you out. Does it matter? I don't know. What are you doing here? 
It seems so are you. It does worry me. You went abroad when you were 13, 12, 13, thereabouts. Was your name Caswell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It's a long time ago, I've forgotten. There's some things one doesn't forget. Possibly. Unhappiness, despair. I dare say. What's your real name? I told you, Leslie, Margaret, Carter, and Carswell. Catherine? Catherine, what the hell are you doing here? Oh, God. I wish to God I'd never come here. interrogating Miss Caswell. You seem to have upset her. What did he say? No, no, it's just all this murder. It's all so horrible. He came over me suddenly. I'll go up to my room. It's, it's impossible. I, I can't believe it. What can't you believe? Six impossible things for breakfast, like the Red Queen? Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> Something like that. Dear me, you look as though you've seen a ghost. I, I have merely seen something that I should have seen before. Blind as a bat I've been. But I think we may finally be able to get somewhere. The police have a clue? Yes, <laughs> Mr. Rem, the police do have a clue. I want everyone in here again. Do you know where they are? Giles and Molly are in the kitchen. I've been helping Major Metcalf look for your skis. We lived in the most entertaining of places. Well, to no avail. I don't know what Palacini is. I'll get him. You get the others. Mr. Palacini! Someone may have lied for some other reasons. 
I'd rather doubt that. Well, what's the idea? You just said you have no means of checking these statements. No, but perhaps if we were to recreate the actions, ah, battle chestnut, the construction of the crime. That's a foreign idea? Not a reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Pavancini, a reconstruction of the actions of apparently innocent persons. And what do you expect to learn from that? You won't mind if I don't say why at the moment. You want a repeat performance? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I do. It's a trap. What do you mean it's a trap? It is a trap, I know it is. I merely want you all to do the same actions as you did before. I can't simply see what you want to learn by making people do things they've done a second time. I think it's just nonsense. Do you, Mr. Wren? Well, all I know is you can count me out. I'm much too busy in the pleasure. Mrs. Ralston, I can't count anybody out. From one look at you all, someone might say that all of you are guilty. Why are you all so unwilling? Of course. You're in charge, Sergeant. We'll cooperate. Hey, Molly! Ren? Miss Caswell? Yes. Father Cheney? Oh, yes, I can say. Macduff? Yes. So, all we to do as we did before? The same actions will be performed, yes. Then I will return to the drawing room. Once again, I shall pick out the tune of a murder. Dum, dum, dum. Not quite so fast, Mr. Pavancini. Mrs. Ralston, do you play the piano? Yes, I do. And do you know the tune of Three Blind Mice? I believe we all know the tune of Three Blind Mice now. <laughs> right. So you can pick it out on the piano just as Pavancini did. Good. I'd like you to go into the drawing room and wait there until I give the signal to play. <coughs> Sergeant, I understood we were each to repeat our former roles. The same actions will be performed, yes, but not necessarily by the same people. Thank you, Mrs. Ralston. I don't see the point. There is a point, sir. It's a means of checking up on these statements, but in particular, one statement. Now, please pay attention. I'm going to give you all your new roles. Mr. Wren, I'll have you go in the kitchen. Just keep an eye on Mrs. Ralston's dinner. You seem to be fond of cooking. Major Metcalf, I'll have you go up to Mr. Ralston's room and trace the telephone wire to the window. Mr. Parvangini, you will go up to Mr. Wren's room, by the back stairs, most convenient way. Miss Caswell, you will go down to the cellar. Mr. Wren will show you the way. Unfortunately, that leaves my job to you, Mr. Ralston. It's a rather chilly one, but you seem to be the toughest person here. And what are you going to do? I will be re-performing the role of Mrs. Boyle. Taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? You will all stay in your places until I've said. Part of games? Don't mind for me wearing my coat. I was suggesting, sir. Take my torch, it's by the curtain. Now, Mrs. Ralston, please count to ten, and then you may begin to play. Yes. Your maiden name is Waring. 
Yes. Ms. Waring, you taught in the school, in the school where those children went. And is it true that the boy Jimmy managed to get a letter to you and you never answered it? It's not true. I never got it. You just didn't bother. That's not true. I, I went down with pneumonia the very day the letter arrived and it, it went to inner side with a lot of other letters and I didn't see it until weeks afterwards. And by then, by then that, that poor child was, was dead. If only I hadn't been ill. If only I, I'd seen that letter. So monstrous that things should happen. Oh yes, Mrs. Ralston. It's monstrous. I thought the police didn't carry revolvers. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Ralston, I'm not a policeman. You thought I was a policeman because I rung up as Superintendent Hoffman to say Detective Sergeant Trotter was coming to save the day. Do you know who I am, Mrs. Ralston? I'm Georgie. I'm Jimmy's brother, Georgie. You better not scream, for if you do, I will fire this. I'd like to talk to you a little. I said I'd like to talk to you a little! Jimmy died! That nasty, cruel woman killed him. Prison wasn't bad enough for her. I said I'd kill her one day, and I did too. In the fall, it was great fun. I'll kill them all when I've grown up, that's what I said. Because grown-ups can do anything that they like. I'm gonna kill you in a minute. You'll never get away safely, you know. Someone has taken my skis. I can't get away. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I've had such fun watching you all and pretending to be a policeman. That gun will make a lot of noise. It will, rather. Better to do it the usual way and take you by the neck. No, no, no! The last little mouse in the trap. business. Didn't know what to do, but fortunately came to me about it just in time. <coughs> well, it started to thaw. Help should be on its way here soon. <laughs> oh, by the way, Mrs. <coughs> Ralston, I'll remove those skis. I hid them on the four poster. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Pav and Chimney. <laughs> <laughs> I get 
Bill will examine their carvings quite carefully. I wouldn't be surprised if they found a thousand or so Swiss watches in a spare wheel. That's probably his profession. Nasty bit of goods. Molly. I believe you thought Giles, I... Giles, what were you doing in London yesterday? Molly. I was buying our anniversary present. <laughs> We've been married just here today. That's why I was in London yesterday, and I didn't want you to know! No! <laughs> oh.